Thank you. It's a huge pleasure to be here. Where is my... Um, aha. I need to... Um, slide share from the beginning. So I'm very, very excited to be here. Oh, if I could work out the technology. <laughs> um, not working. So... Anyway, it's my first time in Iceland. I'm really very excited. It's great to be here. I'm so impressed by the work I've been hearing about in Iceland developing. And I noticed some similarities um, between the UK and Britain in terms of, for example, the gender mix of people in this field. Um, and I have to apologise from the beginning that there is slight technical hitches. So I put the wrong... So the PowerPoint that I was going to be presenting is on a computer that doesn't work with your screen. So I'm going to be... This is a set situation to test and demonstrate levels of stress and cortisol and how they're, <laughs> how they're managed. And so I'll try my best to see, to see, see, see how we go. So what I'm going to be trying to think about is very basic stuff about the, import, really, the importance of early development. And so the model that I think we probably all have these days is a biopsychosocial model. We can't think about the body or the brain or the mind without thinking them as, about them as one thing now, I think. And so, because I come from the Tavistock Clinic, and we have a statue of Freud outside, um, I, ha I will start with, with Freud, who said the first ego is a body ego. And he said interesting things, like a man's states of mind are manifested, he didn't mean men and women, are manifested, he, they, me too wasn't around when Freud was, um, manifested in the tensions and relaxations of the facial muscles, in the adaptations of his eyes, in the amount of blood in the vessels of his skin, in the modifications of his vocal apparatus, and the movements of his limbs. Now, partly the reason why I start with this is I want to think about the effects of early experiences on brains and on bodies in particular. And I don't know what slide's going to come up next because of the technology issues, because I changed it all last, um, so this is an old one. But it's interesting, this statement here, affects and emotions correspond to processes of discharge, the final manifestations of which are perceived as feelings. And Freud said this. It could e so easily have been Antonio Damasio. It could be contemporary neuroscience, I think. And what Damasio has helped to see is that emotions are body states, and a big part of our job is to be in touch with our bodily states and in order to be in touch with emotional states. And the feelings, in a way, are the interpretation of these. And I think this is very interesting in relation to working with parent, mothers and infants, parents, and ourselves, in the sense of how difficult or easy it is to read bodily signals of emotional cues, and what happens in attachment when we don't have these capacities. I like Damasio's statement, the sense of self as embodied is the root of our feelings of having a sense of self. And anybody here also, as well as... Um, having done their own psychotherapy, also has done mindfulness. It's quite a few people, interesting. So um, I think this ability to be in touch with your own body selves and emotional selves are very, very interlinked. And it's really what mothers do for infants, I think, when things are going well. So, why, so this is partly why I wanted to think about the body. I mean, I partly find it very... Something is happening, which means that nothing, something is not happening. I don't know what it is. Um, so well, none of my pictures are working. Um, but anyway, I don't need it. It's fine. This will be fine. So the, one of the reasons why I think working with the body is important is because in a way we're working with the effects of psychological experiences on the body and bodily experiences on the psyche. And it's, very, very, it's all very complicated. And so in a way, how we present ourselves... So you notice I'm doing this. This is a very... So I have Jewish heritage, no beliefs. My family, my father was a pig farmer, which is not a very Jewish thing to be. But it's... Um, but, you know, this is a typical... So, my grandfather used to tell this joke, um, why do Jewish people have short necks? Anybody know? So, so this is a... So, so what, how, the reason why this is important is that in terms of our psychological styles, how we present and in our attachment styles is so much in our bodies. And I'll try to demonstrate what I mean by that as, as, we, as, as we go along. But I, first of all, I just wanted to remind us... <laughs> Babies are ready and willing to be social and sociable. Ethan is just a few seconds old here. He's crying as the midwife passes him back to mother. As soon as he's in mother's arms, he begins to settle. Within ten seconds, he's calm and quiet. A few moments later, 
Mum offers Ethan her breast, but Ethan is much more interested in looking at Mum's face. She talks to him, he clearly responds. When his dad speaks, Ethan turns to him. And when Mum replies, Ethan looks back up at her. Ethan already knows these voices, and he knows they're important to him. A little later, Ethan really shows us what he can do when he's put in his dad's arms. When John sticks his tongue out, Ethan looks hard, concentrates, and then sticks out his own tongue. Ethan does the same thing again a moment or so later. While Ethan is still in his dad's arms, his mum speaks. Ethan immediately looks around and keeps looking at his mum. So just a few minutes into his life, Ethan is already interacting very deliberately with the world and the people around him. So extraordinary things happening. I think probably the most important, I'm afraid this version of PowerPoint doesn't allow me to stop and pause videos. So I, I can't do the things I was, other things I was going to do. I'm making lots of excuses, which is always very bad for a speaker. But I think one of the important things was, if you notice the, if you notice the, the timer at the bottom, this was 14 minutes into a child's life. And just see how much was going on in those few seconds that we saw. So much learning, so much development already, so much capacity for interaction. And you just know, you bet your mortgages that this baby's going to turn into a securely attached child with lots of ease and comfort and trust in, trust in others. And then if we think about our more worrying cases and what a different first 15 minutes of life, let alone first prenatal um, experience prenatally they would have, and then what effect that has go, going on in time. So we, we, if I have more time, I'd love to talk more about what, what, what people just saw. Um, so, one of the reasons why I'm trying to make a link between mind and body is, I'm slightly thrown because this is the wrong order, I keep saying that, I'm going to just relax, it is that what we know is that adverse childhood experiences have profound effect, not just on our psychological development, but on our, on our physiological development. I don't know if people know the adverse childhood experiences studies in America. Cohorts about 18, 19,000 people, the first studies, and then many, many, many more since white middle class sample. So what's really interesting is these are people who suffered major deprivation. But if they had four or more of these adverse childhood experiences, then the chances are that they would have much, much higher rates of all of these problems, health risks, disabilities, social, social problems, every, every kind of psychological problem known, every, every kind of psychiatric presentation known, <coughs> increases with the number of ACEs you have, if you remember, remember what an ACE is. And most worrying, of, so this is a classic stu study um, result. A male child with an A score of six, so six of those scores, has a 4,600% increase in the likelihood of becoming an intravenous drug user compared to a child with an A score of naught. Now, th this is huge. And ACEs predict, as I said, every kind of psychiatric issue, but they predict every kind of physical health issue later on in life. The reason why this is important is that so we can fight for these early intervention programs where we can intervene early with mothers, fathers, infants, communities, so we can make a difference later on in life. Adverse childhood experiences, four or more ACEs, look at the difference in every single condition that you wouldn't expect to be linked with adverse experiences, arthritis, asthma, cancer, much more likely to be diagnosed with cancer, interesting, if you had four or more adverse childhood experiences. The most striking one that I was most surprised about is vision, actually. But a whole range of different issues. So this is really just to make the case, which we all know, but the research is there to back it up now. And there's a whole range of biomarkers that we know about increasingly, which um, shift very dramatically, if, in, if, whether you have a, an infancy like, the, like, the, like that lucky baby I showed you before, or an infancy which is full of stress, trauma, or abuse. So you have higher levels of inflammation, Shorter telomeres. Do people know what telomeres are? They're, no? They're the caps on the end of um, chromosomes that shorten when there's ill health. And they're a very good predictor of um, poor health later on. And 
they sh if you're living in a more stressed environment, more poverty, more inequality, worse parenting, then your telomere is shorter. But you can change these things throughout the lifespan. The best time to change them, of course, is in the first couple of years of life. In fact, they've just found that mindfulness meditation has been shown to increase telomere rates. So, and we know that good parent-infant psychotherapy and that this kind of intervention makes the same difference. So we're talking about changes in the body in a very deep cellular level, epigenetic changes, changes in the way in which genes are expressed and the way that they turn on and off, autoimmune issues, a whole range of things are being profoundly, powerfully affected by the kind of early experiences that we have. So in effect, what we're talking about is the difference between, if we think about it as a kind of template, we're all born with the capacity for what we call what evolutionary attachment theories, theories will call a fast as opposed to a slow life course. So if you're born into a very stressed, scary, um, say violent environment, then what happens is your whole metabolism speeds up because it makes no sense to be chilled and relaxed in an environment which is terrifying. You have to be vigilant and jumpy to survive. And so what happens is your body, you know where we have a kind of switch. If you think of us in our evolutionary inheritance, in one pocket, we have a capacity for a very slow metabolism. In another, we have a capacity for a very fast life course. But this switch turns on or off really early in life, prenatally and, and in the years after, after birth. Are people familiar with these theories of life history theory? So if you're born into a... So, and there's an evolutionary logic to this. If the world is scary and dangerous, and you might not survive that long, and all, most mammals have this predisposition, then the best thing to do is to deal with a fast metabolism, take more risks. You'll probably um, start having um, reproducing earlier, have more infants, have more children, invest less in each one. This is why children from deprived, girls from deprived backgrounds get pregnant so often, very young. And I've never met, I must say, in all these years, of, I've never met a 14-year-old pregnant girl who didn't know how to put on a condom. So we spent so much time giving them sex education, but actually, if we intervened early on, then we wouldn't be seeing these problems. So, um, so for example, what we know is poor, scary environments with high levels of stress in infancy predispose girls to hit puberty earlier. Do people know this research? To speed up the life course. Whereas if you're born in an environment which is like, that, like the baby we saw before, where there's love, care, attention, two parents of whatever gender who, who, who you know you can absolutely rely on, you can slow down, you can relax. Life is good. I can trust that the next thing that happens is likely to be okay. And then you probably will um, hit puberty later as a girl, have less children but invest more in each one. So this is what we see in secure attachment as opposed to insecure attachment. So... These early experiences are having a really profound effect on bodily states and on health outcomes and on life trajectories generally. So if anybody tries to tell you that what you're working with is something, something soft and fluffy and pink to do with touchy feelings, it's, this is not. This is deadly, deadly serious, literally deadly serious stuff. This is a kind of classic, just even an insecure attachment predicts um, earlier puberty, for example. So if we... If I, I'm quite simple-minded, and I tend to think about the brain as a future-predicting machine. So we all learn fast. We saw from that video clip as well, you know, how quickly that baby learned how to imitate. And if something happened once, a baby then tends to expect it to happen a second or third time. And our brains and body were all the time monitoring the, the external environment. So I'm watching you lot to see, is anybody paying attention? Are you interested or not? And I'm also watching my internal environment. What is my cortisol levels doing now? How fast am I breathing? And it's the relationship between these two things, and that's what the brain, body, and the nervous system is doing. But very quickly, an expect something that happens once or twice becomes an expectation. So the child who's, who cries and his mother says that, um, gives a derisive gesture and makes the child feel like, you shouldn't cry, I've got no space for crying in my mind, learns not to cry very, very quickly. Whereas a child who cries and the mother comes and picks them up and gives them a cuddle and makes them feel better, knows that it's not only is safe to cry, it's a good idea because actually I, may, I feel better afterwards. And these become very deeply ingrained, embodied memories well before the capacity to have a kind of conscious memory in the hippocampus is forming. So this is the model I've been talking about. Very, very simple. This comes from the work of Marty Tyke, who's done a lot of very interesting brain research, suggesting that our brain prepares for the world that we happen to be born into. 
And if we're born into a world where there's lots of safety, then all kinds of capacity develop, a much more highly functioned prefrontal cortex. So we develop the capacity for empathy, emotional regulation, planning, executive functions, all kinds of good hormones develop in the body, oxytocin, serotonin, we feel great, the right amount of dopamine, not too little or not too much. If we're born into an environment of toxic stress and developmental trauma, then whole different brain and body mechanisms will be developing and giving rise to a very different life trajectory. It's not wrong, it's not bad, it's exactly the right way for a body to develop in a scary environment or a stressful environment. But it's not, we don't think it's good in the long term. In the, for, in its, we know it's not good for people's psychological or emotional health. And this is partly why we see so many kids in school, for example, who can't concentrate. In, in the UK, we see lots of kids from maltreated backgrounds who can't concentrate, who can't learn, who can't take anything in, because they're still living in that early environment in their heads where there was violence, aggression, lack of care, they have to be vigilant. Why on earth should they concentrate? Why on earth should they trust the adults in front of them? This is the concept of epistemic trust that um, maybe Tessa will talk about that's so central in, um, in terms of attachment. It's come out of the Anna Freud Center in recent years. Why would I trust a teacher if all adults have been untrustworthy up until now, for example? So. Here's another example of um, infant learning. At two months, Hobby's endless examinations of people have given her amazing abilities to recognize them. When she meets this person for the first time, she watches his face intently. great example. So this, of course, is what the developmental researchers call deferred imitation. And it it's basically means this baby has learned already how to interact with this particular person after one experience a day later. Now, lovely example, we're all smiling, but actually just think about some of the things that the babies we work with are learning, and they're not as nice as this. Um, so that they might be learning that this person is scary, that I can't express this, you know, all kinds of much more difficult things. If you think about your most complicated client, patient, and then think about what they learned at this age. It won't be quite so nice, I'm afraid. So, of course, what we know about the brain, in very, in very, very simple language, is that our brain is developing, being sculpted, the architecture of the brain is being sculpted according to the kind of experiences that we have. And, of course, we know we're born with a roughly, no one's ever counted every single one, but roughly 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synapses. But, of course, what happens is those that aren't used get died off, and we use the ones that are needed for our particular context and environment. And the ones that aren't very useful, they go out of business. And Jeffrey Schwartz says, like bus routes with no customers, they go out of business. And bad early experiences, particularly in the early years, has a profound effect on the developing brain, as well as the developing nervous system, as well as a developing neurochemical system. So just to mention a few of the classic things that we know about the brain and the effect of maltreatment gives rise to maltreatment, will give rise to a um, smaller volume and less activity in the prefrontal cortex, give rise to smaller hippocampi in adulthood. Does anybody re remember what the hippocampus is? It's the clues in the question. It's to do with memory. Um, smaller corpus callosum that links left and right hemisphere, much more highly reactive subcortical parts of the brain, particularly the amygdala. Some people think it's bigger, but it's certainly more reactive. Um, much more highly activated stress response system, much more highly activated sympathetic nervous system, which I'm demonstrating today. <laughs> um, higher levels of inflammation, shorter teeth, all of these things are affected by early maltreatment. So if we think about it very simply, some of this, these classic experiments, if you show people, adults or young people, um, freeze-framed moments, um, one at a time, of somebody taking on a, a facial expression, and you press a, you say, press a button when you know what the emotional expression is. 
those who have come from backgrounds where there's maltreatment and violence, for example, will press the button for violence much earlier than the rest of us. They recognise this emotion well before, because they've had to. That was a survival response. And actually, it doesn't matter that much if they get it a bit wrong occasionally, because it's better to get it wrong and assume there's violence and trouble than to be too chilled. So their, so their amygdala is firing up much more quickly than the rest of us. Does that make sense? Um, whereas, actually, if you're, if you're born in, say, one of those horrendous, depriving orphanages, like we used to see in the own Ceausescu re regime in, in Romania, you know, very neglectful environment, their amygdala is firing much more slowly. They are much less able to recognise emotional ones because that's the world they've adapted to, because they haven't needed to recognise people because people haven't been very much part of their lives, in a way. So it's a very different brain that we see in five-year-old, three- and four-year-old neglected orphans as opposed to those from very troubled, traumatising environments. Amy McCrory, the from the Anna Freud Centre, where Tessa comes from, has got this theory of the latent vulnerability, arguing that later psychiatric disorders are absolutely linked with early, the kind of, kind of early experiences that we're talking about. Early maltreatment will give rise to the predisposition for um, later psychiatric disorders. And his work is very, very interesting. He's been looking at um, the brains of maltreated children. And one of the areas he's just discovered, which links beautifully with attachment theory, is how the brains of maltreated kids, the brain areas involved in autobiographical memory are also very profoundly affected by, by maltreatment, which means they can't reflect on their own experience, they can't make sense of things, they have got less sense of who they are in response to other people. They don't believe they're held in mind, and those brain areas just don't develop. <coughs> so more and more of this research is coming through day in, day out. So here's a, another clip, not quite as nice as the other ones, but not so terrible. Watch what happens in your body. In this footage, for instance, you can see just how strongly Alexandra reacts to a door that slams in the wind. Okay, so you're not all smiling, but it's not too terrible. But what happened with this baby is, in its mother's arms, has a bit of a shock, shock like, you all should be very good psychotherapists and social workers, because I can see you all reacting in that empathic way. But um, what, what would happen is that, there is that the stress response would fire, you, you see a, a cortisol re reaction, an adrenaline release, um, body tension, and then the baby will calm down very quickly if they're in their mother's arms. Imagine if that door was slamming in a home where there's violence, abuse, trauma, shouting, screaming. That door slamming would signify something very, very different, and the baby just wouldn't calm down as quickly. And they would be quicker to react and much slow, but more importantly, much slower to calm down. Which is why some of these kids, they, they, they seem to get triggered by things that nobody notices. Teachers say, well, nothing happened, just lost it. Often they're picking up things that we don't pick up out of consciousness, I think, because they haven't been helped to modulate and regulate emotional experience early on in their lives. I thought this was a really interesting study, and I'm sure there's other ones. It's a very simple study. What they did is they sent questionnaires to couples who had babies of 6 to 12 months and they, about how much conflict there was in the, in the family. And then they brought the babies and the mothers into the laboratory, and by some miracle, they managed to get the babies to sleep in the laboratory at the same time as they put an EEG scanner on their heads. And what they found, and then they played, I'm sorry guys, then they played a slightly deep, not very aggressive, but a deep male voice signifies the predator. <laughs> and what they found was that the babies whose parents had said there was more conflict in the home, so they only said there was more conflict, in their, in these babies in their sleep at six to 12 months, the brain areas involved in stress reactivity were mu and fear were much more highly activated. So it just shows how early the brain is being sculpted and our, our whole bodies and beings are preparing for the world that we, we expect because of what we've already experienced. At six to 12 months in their sleep, these babies were more stressed in response to a strange, strange male voice. I think that's phenomenal. And then, and, and, and so, so, so early. So this is a kind of cartoon from something I wrote called The Good Life, which is a very simple model of the autonomic nervous system, as we know. But what we know, people are familiar with the work of Stephen Porges, or not? Anybody? 
one. Okay, I better explain something. So, um, so if we think about, we say, in medical, in most medical schools, we still think think about the autonomic nervous system in terms of the sympathetic nervous system when you're very stressed, like you saw me, because the computer wouldn't work, and the parasympathetic nervous system when you're very either very calm and relaxed or you go almost into kind of very shut down states. What Stephen Porges has argued is that actually there's three branches of the autonomic nervous system, and when we're feeling relaxed and at ease, um, we had a nerve called the ventral vagus nerve fires up. We feel relaxed, we feel calm. We're in what they call a window of tolerance. Our oxytocin is flowing, our breath is deep, our just, digestion's good, we have much better social um, engagement, eye contact. Muscles around the face here are firing up. It's very interesting. So if you ever see somebody smile and you don't trust their smile, look around here. If you look at Donald Trump's face, there's nothing going on up here. <laughs> and it's... Um, all here. So, but the, this is really crucial, linked with the vag vagus nerve. It's and it turns off. It should turn off when there's danger. So, so six lions come come through Reykjavik into the children's hospital. Then we all get frightened. We go into symp sympathetic nervous system reactivity. We start sweating, tense muscles, breathe. You know, fight flight response. Pupils dilate. All of these sorts of things. The trouble is, we're designed to come back into this system, aren't we? And afterwards, like the baby who where the door slammed. But so many of the kids that I work with these days, I work a lot with abused and abusing children now who've come from very traumatizing backgrounds, is that they don't ever calm down and come into this window for them is very, very narrow. And they, they're up here all the time and they don't know how to calm down. And I really want to think about this for a moment. So there's a lot, what happens in the environment of the, the worst situation when this fails, when fight or flight fails, and we see babies and infants and all animals go into a kind of numbing freeze response, a kind of dissociative shutdown space. And I think this is important for anyone working with infants because we don't worry about these babies because it looks like they're not worried. So if somebody's in sympathetic nervous system reaction and they're jumpy and they're anxious, you know, kids are throwing things across the room, you know there's a problem and you respond and you get anxious yourself. In the presence of these kids, who often have glazed eyes, they're not causing any trouble in school if you're any teachers here. So in a, in a way, you do, you're quite glad to have some very quiet kids in the back of the classroom, but actually these are the ones we should be most worried about, who go into kind of fugue-like dissociated shutdown states. Um, so, and we can shift from here to here, here. This is, in a way, the defense mechanism of last resort. A predator has you in their mouth, Fight, it's too late for fight or flight, all you can do is numb down and go into metabolic shutdown. So I just wanted to point that out because I, I think that we have to, these kids are underrepresented in services but they're the ones with the worst prognosis. Okay, here's another very, very simple model from compassion focused therapy. Thinking about, who think about, there's many more systems in the body than this but they talk about having a soothing and connection system, a drive system and a threat and protection system. And what we, in many of the families we're working with, you've got to have a highly activated threat and protection system, which is more like this one up here. And either this is too small or too big. So, for example, babies who, mothers who are very depressed in a very withdrawn way have very low dopamine levels. And so do their babies by two or three months. And they have no joy and excitement in life. So these are the kids that need upregulating, whereas the ones who are in here too much who are all over the place, they need help down-regulating. So we have to make sort of clinical choices all the time, depending on the kind of early experiences that we have. And very often, we, we, we see these systems working together, and this one doesn't get a look in, and that's what we're trying to develop, if you like. So what, I'm say, what we're saying, in a way, is that attachment theory is, uh, is suggesting that it's not that insecure attachment is bad, it's an appropriate response to an environment which might not be the optimal environment for a child. So, for example, many of the maltreated kids I work with who have adopted into very benign, caring homes, in their minds, they're still living in the abusive environment. So a loving mother comes up to them with a hairbrush to brush their hair like this maybe the mother did with their biological children, her biological children, and the child flinches and hits back at the mother. That's because in their mind, they're still living in the early environment they, they adapted to. And what we're trying to do is, so in your work, you've got the chance to change this before it becomes such a deeply entrenched adaptation, if you like. Now, I was gonna, just gonna show a bit of this, but I won't be able to because of the, um, 
Everybody knows the strange situation tests. So, so maybe in terms of body states and body awareness, it just might be worth thinking about for a moment. I won't show it if everybody's seen this. Everybody's seen strange situation tests. So what you know, of course, is a 20-minute procedure. The mother leaves the room. There's a stranger, etc. Et the stranger comes in, etc. What we know is that in a securely attached child, when the mother leaves the room, the baby starts crying and screaming. And I might show a second or two just because. Um, is Helen Lee up in here with her mother, Jeanette? We're going to significantly break up the situation in the situation and see how she reacts. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask Jeanette to slip out of the room to be held in the entire room. Oh, right. smile on the baby's face when the mother came back into the room. But what happened in our bodies when that baby cried? Didn't every single one of you want to get up and pick the baby up? Um, and what happens in avoidant attachment? In avoidant attachment, you have a mother or a father who can't bear to be in touch with the emotions of a child. So the baby becomes... So if you, in a strange situation test, the mother leaves the room and it looks like the baby doesn't care. They carry on crying. These are the... I mean, they carry on playing. These are the kids who nursery workers don't worry about because they don't protest, they don't complain, they don't look anxious. And actually in their presence we feel very unworried and we should be feeling much more worried than we do. So in a way it's our bodily responses, what we call in psychoanalysis our bodily counter-transference that give us our clue. The, the bit of you that wanted to get up and reach for that baby will not be the present and alive with these very avoidant babies. And there's often a kind of a flatness and lack of interest in response to them. And that's very difficult. And one of the things that's happening in these babies that we know is that although they look like they don't care that the mother leaves the room and they don't seem to care that when the mother comes back, if you measure some of their vital signs like their heart rate or their skin conductance, it's going up nearly as much as the securely attached child. So what that means is their body is giving signals of distress and their mind is not able to read those signals of distress because Every baby should read Bowlby and know that their first job is to retain proximity to their primary caregiver. And so if, if, my, if, I, if I've got a choice, I listen to my body or I respond in the way my mother ex can manage, which is not to cry, it's no contest. I will, I will cut off from my bodily signals of distress in order to be, retain proximity to my caregiver. But that is at a big cost because then there's a split in the personality. You can't read your own bodily signals. Does this make sense? So these things are happening really, really early on. And of course, memories, I can't show you this one either because it's too long, but memories are embodied memories. So there's a, um, this very interesting new idea that I'm very glad to have seen come out of places like the Anna Freud Center called parental embodied mentalizing, which I'm hugely relieved about because I always think of mentalization as too much a kind of mind-to-mind -mind thing and actually, so, the body is so important, and what we see when you see good parenting, like in that one, the clip before, is you see really embodied attunement, don't you? It's all about the cues and gestures and signaling. Instead, in the slide that I didn't, the other slide that didn't work, when I showed you the gesture, that um, I had very nice Icelandic gestures. I'd have to find them for, because um, I'm expecting to see some very interesting Icelandic gestures tomorrow at the football match. But it's. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, so all of these things are happening out of consciousness. Um, Stephen Porges has this idea of neuroception, which is we're picking up cues out of consciousness which have a profound effect. So I'm, we're always sort of half scanning for safeness or danger, how safe or how, and our nervous system responds. So, for example, boys brought up in areas where there's more boarded-up shops and more potential you know, um, degradation, they have higher testosterone levels. They're much more likely to take, um, 
take, a di take drugs. So they're not conscious of this, but in a way the environment affects us. If we're, sitting in an if we're sitting in a room with a beautiful view, our body is different to if we sit in a room with, um, with just a, br a brick wall or graffiti. So these things have a very profound effect. For me, the reason why I find this is important, not only because we're making a case that actually our experiences have a profound effect, early experiences have a profound effect on the body, but also in terms of our work with the people we work with, five minutes, um, it's our own embodied responses that almost have the biggest, give us the biggest clues about what's going on. If I'm with a child and I'm feeling very dull down and flat, I should watch that. Have you ever had an experience of being with a patient and you suddenly find yourself making shopping lists or thinking about what you're going to make for dinner? It's normally a sign that they're dulled down. But, but when some of these very activated kids, there's no way you're making shopping lists. You're all the time responsive. So in a way, we're, uh, our, bo our embodied countertransference is very attuned to the people we're with. And it gives us the, our biggest clues. I find that I'm, I'm almost completely different in my mind and body with every single patient I work with. And that increasingly is, I find, my biggest clue about what's going on. And again, for time, I won't, I won't go into this, but there's some quite interesting clinical research which shows how if you just video um, patients and therapists, actually the biggest clue to what's going on in the patient is how the therapist responds. Um, and what we know is, for example, just listening to more dismissive attachment-related discourses leave us less interested, not only in the person we're with, but actually the next person we speak to. So these are a, a, a very profound effects, and they're all happening out of consciousness, which is partly why developing this capacity, I think that therapeutic workers should all be helped to tra be trained in interceptive capacities, reading our own bodily signals as a clue to making sense of what's going on out there. We apparently, I don't know, I have to check this is right, 11 billion bits of data are processed by our brains every second. It's a lot of data. Um, but, we, but the brain can only consciously process 40 of these bits. So what, what's important is so much of this stuff is happening non-consciously, unconsciously. Um, so what I've been saying, I suppose, is early experiences have a profound effect on how we perceive the environment. And all the time... You know, we, we're living in an environment inside the body and outside the body, and our nervous system, through this process that Paul just calls neuroception, which is picking up cues non-consciously, we're working out if the world is safe, in which case we can relax, we can breathe more deeply, etc., or is there danger, in which case we move into fight, flight, free mus muscular tension, or if there's serious life threat and we go into immobilized postures. But either way, and there's all, all kinds of gradations in between these, but what we're trying to do, of course, is we're trying to create this environment with the mothers and babies, the parents that we're working with. And I'm going to show you one more video clip because I have to show a man. Father, during one 30 second period, Jordan and his grandfather have discovered each other. They begin a playful interaction while they look eye to eye. Jordan looks at grandfather's mouth and sees it open. He imitates this action and again looks eye to eye. As grandfather opens his mouth wide in laughter, Jordan follows, opening his mouth even wider. Jordan throws his arms in excitement and watches his grandfather's eyes, lifting his head like grandfather does. Now it's a game between them. Notice how Jordan lifts his left arm and actually reaches out and touches grandfather's mouth, where the game is being played. Grandfather now opens his mouth wider. And with great energy, Jordan follows suit. They take much delight in this joyful engagement. Jordan throws his head back and opens his mouth even a bit wider. A moment of pause, but they're still engaged. Now Grandfather switches to puckering his lips. The baby looks at Grandfather's face. Jordan focuses on the mouth and imitates the puckering. After Jordan turns away to rest, Grandfather paces himself to the baby, which is so important. All infants... So, I think that's really important in all kinds of different ways, but um, partly we need, we need the dads involved, we need men involved as well. But just think of how much learning, that was 30 seconds, how much learning, how much reciprocity, how much mutual attunement was going on, how much real attention 
attempt to understand the other being and what, how much that doesn't happen when things are going wrong. I thought particularly the last bit was very important. The baby turned away and the grandfather waited for the baby to come back. Now, what we know is the baby's heart rate will go up about five seconds so the baby's body is signaling, actually I need a bit of a rest, granddad, I love you, but I need a bit of a rest. And the granddad waits for him to come back. Now, if the grandfather needed the baby's attention, and so in that way that Daniel Stern and Beatrice Beebe used to talk about, chase and dodge, force the attention on the baby, the baby would have to, again, override their bodily signals of needing a rest. And that has a very profound effect on the baby's development. So it's these subtle cues, that, cues and clues that are so important. So just to finish off then, really, I like this quote from William Blake. We put on this earth a little space that we might learn to bear the beams of love. And I feel so many of the kids we work with and adults I work with have lost the ability to bear the beams of love. They've turned off from it because they don't trust it. And we're in the business of, so we can't pretend that that isn't what we're doing. And so much of this, as Alice Miller said, the truth about our childhood is stored up in our body. And although we can repress it, we can never alter it. Our intellect can be deceived, our feelings manipulated, conceptions conceived, body tricked with medication, but someday our body will present its bill. And I think that we can't forget that, really. And so being aware of our own bodies in response to who we're working with and the bodily embodied states, rather than just the co cognitive stuff, um, is so, so crucial. But actually, this has been said much better by another philosopher that I'd like to um, teach you, Charlie Brown, who says, this is my depressed stance. When you're depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. The worst thing you can do is straighten up and hold your head high because, it, because then you start to feel better. And if you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this. So anyway, thanks very much, everybody. Thank